The last 48 hours for me, just to think I was laying on a hospital table just not, not even 48 hours ago and all of that fun stuff, but it all turned out well. Carla could give you all the details. I didn't understand it. I just woke up and I now have three parts missing from my big toe. That's all I know. They took three things out. Um, she can tell you all the details on that, but thank you for all of the thoughts and the prayers and the well wishes. And Dorothy and Roger, thank you for the Oreos. You're right. That is the best cure ever. Um, they are phenomenal. So appreciate all of it. I'm going to attempt to get through the sermon this morning without sitting down. We shall see how it goes. My wife's giving me the evil eye right now, but she can't do anything about it right now. So, uh, James chapter 4 in the last few verses, 13 through 17. And I titled this message a, a Practical Atheist or Practical Atheism. Um, I think it speaks a lot, especially this time of year um, at Christmas time, because we start looking at Christmas and we look at the birth of Jesus. Then again, I think when we get to Easter time, those are probably the two big times where everybody believes in God. They believe in God, but they don't want to listen to God. So an atheist is one that is defined as one who believes in the existence of a God or a supreme intelligent being. There's just nothing out there. And then a practical atheist is one who believes in God, but lives as though he does not exist. And I think we see a lot of that in the church today. Um, many people in the church will go to church every single Sunday. They'll, they'll marry, they'll get married, they'll have families, they'll choose occupations, um, they'll, they'll buy and sell all sorts of different things with very little or no thought to the will of God in their lives. So they believe in God, but they don't live as though he exists and has a plan for them. They rarely seek the will of God before they make those important decisions in their life, no matter what they might be. And this is nothing new. We see it in the church today. James saw it 2,000 plus years ago in the church back then. And he's telling the church here, he's calling the church to put God first and seek his will, God's will, in everything that they do. So in James chapter 4, starting in verse 13, it says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such, and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin." And so James is pretty much laying it out here for him. He, he's closing it up here, getting ready to dive into the fifth chapter. And, but, but he's laying it all out for the church and, and, and telling them and challenging them, you need to make plans for your future, yes, but you can't make plans for your future while neglecting the will of God in your life. And so let's look at the context. We've talked about this from the beginning of James to now. The context of who James is speaking to. Many, many of the people in this church were, um, were former businessmen. They were people of wealth who had made a lot of money, but now they had lost a lot of that because of their faith. They had stood firm in their faith and people were like, eh, you're one of those crazy Christians. We're not going to do business with you anymore. You know, your God talked about cannibalism and stuff like that with communions. It's just kind of some of that weird, wacky stuff out there, that religious stuff. So we're not going to do business with you. And they stood firm. They stood firm in their faith. Now, as time goes on, a few of the people in the church are like, you know, I know how to make money and I'm good at it. And I know how we can make money. If we just go over to this city over here, just for a year or two, we could go over there and we can just, we can rake it in and then we can come back and do our thing here. And they now had this plan and their hearts were now beginning to turn from the will of God to more of their material matters in their life. They were looking at the things that they wanted in their life that they were used to. And the problem with their plan is not that they wanted to make money. It wasn't the fact that they wanted to make a living. James is pointing out to him that the problem with their plan was is that they left God out of their plans. They simply said, hey, I know how to make money. I know how to do this. And they didn't include God in their planning. They just knew what they could do in their own strength. 
And so James goes on to remind the people of a very vital truth here. He says in verse 14, he says, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. He lets them know, hey, guys, you can do everything you're saying you're going to do. You can make all the plans that you want, but you cannot control what happens in the future. You have no idea what tomorrow will bring in your life. You can make the plans and they may happen or they may not happen because something else might creep into your life. And he goes on in verse 15, he says, And said, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this or that. See, you need to take into account the will of God. And I think a lot of times we see this in modern society. You know, um, my, my grandfather was, was a very, um, uh, very, very self-made man. And he was proud of that, that he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps and he made his fortune. And he did all those things. And I think we see that a lot in our society where we don't take into account the will of God when we make our plans. And we have to understand that God is the one. He is the one who determines what will happen today. He determines what will happen tomorrow and in the future in our lives. You can make your plans. You can do whatever you want, but you must include God. You have to seek him and you have to find out what his will is for your life. That's what James is laying out for the church here. And so many times in today's society, we see this practical atheism. Well, yeah, I know there's God, but I've got a plan and I'm going to follow my plan. One of the things that I had to do for my grad school work is we had to create a life plan. And you had to write it out and you had to write it out in the first person that, you know, I'm going to do this and then this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And, you know, you're going to speak it into existence, basically. You know what I've accomplished in that life plan? A big old zero because God had other plans for me. God had a different route that he wanted me to take. And it's not saying that I failed in that plan. I, I, I did what I had to do to pass the class, right? And so I, I wrote this plan. But God had a different route that he wanted me to take. And just because your plans don't come to fruition doesn't mean that, it's not, that, that you're not successful. And see, there's nothing wrong with planning for tomorrow. I think we should. We have to plan and prepare and prep for the future. We have to do those things. And we should plan our time. We should plan our resources to make the most effective use of what God has given us in this world. And so many times we don't do that. We think of the here and the now. And we think of, well, I want this, so I'm going to do whatever I have to do in order to get what that is that I want. Instead, we forget to take that time. We, take, we forget to lay it out on the altar and to take time and pray to God and ask God, God, how would you have me to spend this time? How would you have me to live out my life and to spend my money? We don't do that very often because we become practical atheists. We know God's around us. We know he's real. We can see all of creation, but we have different plans. And we don't consult his will. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your works to the Lord and then your thoughts will be established. So when we lay it all out before God, God will show us the way in which we should go. I found this very, very interesting. Um, the Puritans, you know, so we think of our pilgrim forefathers. The pilgrims were often known to close any of their writings. So if they wrote a communication to a loved one, to a business person, any, any type of writing, they would close their writings with the initials DV. I had no idea what this meant, but it was Latin. And it's Deo, Deo Volente is what it is. And Deo Volente simply means this little phrase, God willing. So they would write out all of their plans. This is what we want for you. This is how we feel, whatever it might be. And then they would close every single writing with this idea, if God allows it, if God wills. And we should write this. This should be the cry of our heart as Christians today. This should be all over our decisions that we make in our lives. This should be all over our heart in everything that we do, in our jobs, 
in our relationships, with our families, with investments, with every single day activities, everything that we do, we should write DV, Deo Volente, or God willing in our lives. And everything that we do, it should be the overriding consideration, no matter what it is, no matter how bad you want it. Does God, is that God's will for your life? Deo Volente. It speaks of a heart that places God's will before all other considerations, before your own will. And I'm challenging you today, make that your heart's cry, that you sign off on everything that you do with DV, Deo Valente, God willing. That should be the cry of our heart. Because we, we think, oh, I have plans, I have ideas, and we all do, but God might have something different and God might have something better for us. And then we have these plans and we think, oh, I got plenty of time. It, it, it'll get done. I have plenty of time. James writes, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So James is letting the church here know that he says, you know, yeah, you got these plans. You guys are really smart. You know how to make money. You know how to do all those things, but your plans are foolish. They're foolish. You can't even control what's happening around you in the current day. What do you think the effect your ideas or your plans are going to have on tomorrow? Solomon said this in Proverbs 27. He says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Your life can change in an instant. In the snap of a finger, your life is different. Sicknesses come upon. Your finances change. There's unforeseen situations that happen every single day in our lives. Death comes without notice. We don't know. And so James uses this very important word here, the word vapor, referring to a mist. And I thought a lot of different ways to describe this. And one of the things I remember when I moved to the great frozen tundra of Iowa, I had seen this before, but I'd never really truly experienced cold until I lived in Cedar Falls and experienced my first winter there. I had no idea how cold air could be. And then your lungs hurt. I mean, just everything, your face hurts, everything hurts. But when you breathe in that cold air, you, you, you breathe out on a cold winter day, you breathe in the, the, the air, and then you breathe out, and then there's this puff of mist that you watch come out of your mouth. And it's, it's, it's actually kind of mesmerizing when, when you see it, but then it's gone. And then you do it again, and you see that mist, and you just watch that mist come out of your mouth, and it just fades away into nothingness. See, our life is that vapor. It may seem long, but when we compare it to eternity in heaven with God, it's like our breath on a cold winter day. It appears and it's gone. That's what he's referring to. That life is short and we have to live our lives for the glory of God and for his will in everything that we do. Psalms 39 says, Lord... Make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man is at his best state, at his best state is but a vapor, Selah. See, we must never, ever assume we can never assume that we have plenty of time because we don't know what tomorrow may bring. We don't know, as the writer says here, what is the measure of our days. Lord, help to show me that. And as we look at the totality of Scripture here and we understand that God is God, that God came down from heaven and took on flesh, took on, as we celebrate this time of year and we remember Jesus Christ coming to be the little baby in the manger, God came to be Emmanuel, God with us. And He walked this earth, He lived on this earth a perfect life. And he was crucified and died on a Roman cross, was placed in a borrowed tomb and rose three days later from the dead, walked this earth again and was witnessed going back up into heaven with his father. But he left us this promise that he would come back for his church. 
As we look into those things and we understand that I really don't have a lot of time. As we look at the situations in the world around us, we need to understand if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, if you are not saved today, you need to come to him today. You need to come to Jesus while there's still time. You know, we hear stories all the time, oh, on their deathbed they accepted Christ. And those are wonderful stories. And they are celebrating in heaven in eternity with God today. But the odds are, if you don't make that decision, you won't have that time or that opportunity. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians as he wrote to the church. And in an acceptable time I have heard you. And in that day of salvation I have helped you. Behold now. Today is the accepted time. Behold now is the day of salvation. We start thinking in terms of life being short. And I have plenty of time to do all sorts of different things. But we don't know. We think to ourselves, well, you know, I don't really want to do that yet. There's, there's some other things in my life that I want to do. I'm not really ready to step into the church or to a ministry role right now because the right time isn't here just yet. I need to make a little bit more money or I need to get a little bit more secure in my job or whatever it might be. And we put off doing what God wants us to do for him in our lives today is the day to stop that. Today is the day to stop putting off serving God and to make things right with Him and to serve Him faithfully and to walk in His will. And I don't know what that is for you. I don't know if God's called you to stand behind a pulpit, to lead songs, to vacuum the floors, to do whatever it is, but stop putting off serving God today because you may not have another opportunity. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait another second to repair the broken relationships in your life. Because the time is now. Because you may never have another opportunity again to repair that relationship. Maybe you're in that broken relationship right now and you're just, I'm waiting for the right time. I'm waiting for that person to come around. I'm waiting for that person to to, to open the door and to give me that opportunity to tell them how much I truly love them and how much I truly, truly appreciate everything that they do for me. And and then I'll I'll, I'll let them know that everything's okay and that I love them and, and thank you for everything you've done for me. You may not have another opportunity to ever do that. January 2nd, 2014. Most of you know this story. I was teaching my class when there was a knock on the door of the classroom door. And my wife was standing out there holding a cell phone saying, call your dad. And my mom had died of a heart attack on the living room floor. I had not spoken to my mother in over four months. And to this day, I can't even tell you why we were mad at each other. I don't remember. All I know is I never had another opportunity. I never had another opportunity to say, Mom, I love you. Regardless of the things that were said and done, I love you. My last chance to do that was in a funeral home before they closed the casket lid. You may never have another opportunity. Be careful how you make your plans and how you spend your time because one day it will all be gone. All of it. And we need to take the words of David to heart. As David cried out to God in Psalms 90, he said, Teach me to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach me, God, to understand how precious our loved ones are. Teach me to understand how precious the days are. Because I don't have plenty of time. And then James tells the church, you need to do what's right. He says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is a sin. James is telling us that we are guilty of sin when we fail to do what God is telling us to do. 
And failing to do the will of God is just as much of a sin as adultery, as theft, as lying, as murder. The list goes on and on and on. A sin is a sin is a sin. And when we know what God wants to do and we don't do it, we are missing the mark of God's will. We are missing what he's called us to do. So how do I know this? How do... How do I know what to do as a Christian? Well, you're never going to know the will of God in your life unless you read his word. You have to get into the word of God. You cannot rely on some feeling that you get in your heart or your gut. You can't rely on a a, a little tingling sensation that you feel in, in, in your spine. And you cannot rely or trust the words of another person as to what the will of God is for your life. Now, there's going to be people out there that guide you. There's going to be people out there that walk along and hold you up and support you. I agree. But God is the one who will direct your paths. God is the one who will speak to you through his scriptures, through his words, and he will guide that path, and you can trust it. You can always, always, always trust the word of God. When you read his word, he will show you exactly how to live your life and to walk in his will. Whereas my opinion, my guidance is in the flesh. My guidance, even though well-intentioned as we pray every week, will fall short of that mark. You need to trust in the word of God. When we don't know what to do, when we're just lost and we have no idea what that will of God is for us, we go to him in prayer and we ask him to guide our steps. And he has promised us in his word that he will. In Psalms 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. A practical atheist understands that God exists. A practical atheist understands that God is real and God formed all of this, but they just choose to live their life as though he doesn't. We need to understand that God is real. Everything around us cries out the beauty of God's handiwork. And we need to understand that he exists and he is real. He controls all the issues of life, but it's up to us to seek his will and to walk in his will in everything that we do. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 6, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things, everything around you, all of this will be added unto you. We have to refuse In this world today, in the world that we live in today, that is so contrary to the word of God, we have to refuse to live like practical atheists, doing our will while ignoring the will of God. Because he has so much more for us. And James tells us, our life is but a vapor, it's but a mist, it'll be gone in a second. Live your life. Live your life for the will of God. Study his word, dive into his word, and he will reveal to you the path that he wants for you. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for your word today. I thank you for the strength and the ability to share your word. And Father, I pray today if there be anybody within the sound of my voice here or online who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they would make today the acceptable day of salvation, that they would cry out to you even where they're at right now, Father, and they would know and they would with their lips cry out to you, Father, that you are Lord and you are God and they want you to be Lord and Master of their life. And Father, for those of us who... You know, for all intent and purposes, have been living our lives as practical atheists. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would just begin to work in our hearts and our lives and that you would help us, Lord, to study your word, to understand your word, and to know exactly what your will is for our hearts and our lives so that we can serve you and glorify you in all that we say and do. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.